up on Lattice QCD. And I just realized that when I introduce algebra, uh, someone reminded me that my introduction was wrong. Yeah. Uh, so you should pay more attention to the lecture, because he's actually really an expert. Uh, so you can use Lattice. And this last one, right, so that we won this uh, very prestigious award in the Lattice community. It's called Ken Wilson. It's uh, given to, it's uh, supposedly uh, given to Best uh, young lattice gauge theorist. Right? And there's only uh, one per year. And he was the last year based on his work on nuclear physics and lattice. So today he was stuck talking about this exciting thing. Wonderful. Thank you. And I forgot to mention last time that thank you for inviting me to be here. <laughs> this is my third time in Taiwan. First time here, first time here. So, did anybody do the homework? No. That's too bad. Okay, so last time we were talking about the strong coupling. But we may want the AC instead of uh, the quiet. <laughs> if you're at all like me, you may prefer the AC to the quiet. So we were talking about the strong coupling constant. And please remind me to write B if you can't see in yeah, some order in perturbation theory, there's this value where the coupling constant diverges. It's just to define it to be lambda QCD. And of course, you see in the IQ squared region, uh, the coupling actually runs to zero. I just want to point out this and comment a little, this behavior of the theory, that the coupling runs to zero in ultraviolet, is precisely what makes lattice or QCD a theory in a solving computer. So this is why Frank Wilczek called QCD the most perfect physical theory we have. So why does that help us solve the theory on a computer? Anybody have an intuition for that? So imagine taking the universe and chopping it up into a lattice grid, right? So we take our universe. <coughs> and we discretize the universe. So here, the smallest distance scale is A. This is the lattice facing. And in paper, of course, we can take the universe still infinitely large, and in a computer, practically speaking, just for later notation, the size of the universe we typically call L. But what's the important part? You all remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, I assume. So, delta x, delta p. So what does that mean? That means what we can do is we can take our numerical distribution we can take the, the lattice spacing smaller and smaller. What does that mean? As we take A, the delta x smaller, that means delta p has to get bigger. So what does that mean? That means the gauge coupling of the theory is evaluated at a larger and larger energy scale. So as you take the limit A to zero, what you're really doing is probing the theory at a scale, 1 over a squared, right? So what that means is as you take an arbitrarily small scale, 
you know exactly the theory you want to write in the computer. Because as A goes to zero, or Q squared goes to infinity, the theory actually decouples and becomes a theory of three gluons and three quarks. So you know the exact theory to write in the computer. That's the important point. Whereas in QED, we had this Landau pole. We didn't know how to go to arbitrarily large Q squared because the theory just does not make sense in the ultraviolet. Whereas in QCD, the exact opposite happens. And so then you can let the computer handle all the infrared non-perturbative physics, and you can just put the exact theory you want on the computer. So what this, this is, again, the reason why QCD is defined as lattice QCD as A goes to zero, and there's no approximation you have to make to do that. That's the most important part. So we are exactly solving QCD with the one assumption that you can't prove about any non-perturbative theory are you in the right, what's called, universality class? Meaning, you could imagine your discretization has introduced some new physics that puts you in the wrong phase of the theory. And then you're just out of luck. And there's no way to prove you're in the right phase of the theory. The only thing you can do is do calculations compared to experimental physics. And if you benchmark your calculation, normalize it to experiment, and then start predicting other things that are measured, and you agree, then you know you've recovered the right theory. But there's absolutely no approximation in numerical lattice QCD in this sense. So you can solve exact. This is why lattice QCD in the limit if A goes to zero is QCD. In fact, it's the only way we know how to define the theory of QCD non perturbatively. Okay. So practically speaking, of course, you can't take A to zero in the computer. So what do you do? If you take A sufficiently greater than any dynamically interesting scale in QCD, then what you know, in fact, you can show your lattice QCD. Here, this is the action over the, you know, the integral over the Lagrange density. You know the action can be expanded in a series, sum over n, m, let's say n greater than or equal to 4, m greater than or equal to 0, a to the n alpha strong to the n uh, sum s, n, m, where n counts the dimension of the, the operators are included. So at n equals 4, we have standard QCD. Uh, I think what I really want is n minus 4 here. That makes more sense. So the first term in the expansion is exactly QCD. And then every other term vanishes with some higher power of the last spacing. So basically, we can do a Taylor expansion about the continuum limit. And so then what you can do is you can systematically include these disparatization effects and extrapolate them to zero. Yeah. All right. So now, before we actually disparatize the theory, let's recall the uh, relation between our operator language for quantum field theory and the path integral language. Because it turns out for lattice QCD, we're going to need the path integral from Feynman. So recall, if you take the time order product, here I'll just use some scalar field theory. The time order product of some set of operators So this is an endpoint correlation function, but this is exactly the same as integral, remember this is the complicated functional integral over all possible field configurations of these commuting number fields. Uh, 
and I forgot one important thing. We have to normalize by our partition function, where the partition function is defined as the same object except without these fields here. So here I'll just write this as IS. So what's the point? These are operators in quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. These are difficult things to program on a computer. These are commuting numbers. This is exactly the kind of thing that you can program on a computer. So this is where the lattice QCD is going to be uh, actually solved in this pattern of the language. But then we also, we, next lecture, we'll talk a little more about this. This helps us understand what we should expect to see on the computer. Okay, and so then what we need to do is integrate over all possible field configurations. So this is an infinite dimensional integral. You can't do it. You can't do it on a computer. But you can see now why discretizing the theory will allow you to do so. So if you now take your universe again and chop it into bits, Suddenly, you turn an infinite dimensional integral into a finite dimensional integral. So you can do this on a computer. Now, practically speaking, you still cannot do this integral because this is a complex phase. And there's no way you can integrate over all the possible field configurations, over all the possible sites in the universe. So just so you know, the typical uh, lattice QCD calculation we'll have something like n, say, equals 32 sites in one direction. And you have four space-time dimensions, so you have n to the fourth sites. And so then you can see you can't take n very big in lattice QCD. Also, typical lattice spacing, say, is 0 0.1 Fermi. And so you can see the entire universe we're simulating is on the order of only three Fermi big. And so if you want to actually do a real calculation, uh, your universe is pretty small. But that's okay, because the world of QCD, this is big enough. This is effectively approximately infinite. So, but the point is, you still cannot do this integral. So this would say step one, we have to discretize. All right, but we have to do something else to actually do the numerical integration. So step two. Well, we're going to go to Euclidean space-time. Why do we do that? Because then the Euclidean half integral, so now we're integrating over Euclidean fields, becomes e to the minus and so now you can see how you could start to apply an algorithm to actually do the integral because not every single s will be as important. Clearly, only the small values of actions will be important. Those are the ones that are going to dominate the integral. And so now what we need is a method to determine what's the, the uh, optimal values of s that maximize this integral. So that's step three. So what do you do? You can use this as a probability weight. And you can do a Monte Carlo simulation. Maybe you probably all heard about Monte Carlo numerical integration methods in your, in your coursework. So now we're going to do a Monte Carlo. We're going to use e to the minus action as the weight to determine what is the most important configurations to pick. And then it gets a little more complicated. You have to make sure, of course, you have to use the equations of motion of the theory and be able to run your Markov chain forward and backwards if the word is ergodic. So you need to make sure ergodic. OK, I don't know if I spelled that right, but this is a very important thing for any algorithm you develop. You have to make sure you can, in order to conserve probability, you have to be able to go forwards and backwards in this Monte Carlo time. I won't say any more about that. But then, the 
the point is you generate a set of phi i, let's say i equals 1 to some number n, that minimize s. So this also you'll notice is very similar to how you recover classical mechanics from quantum mechanics. You want to find the optimal values of the action. The action that is classical is the, the minimal action. And so you're doing something similar. You're looking for trajectories that are as close to the, the classical action as possible. And so you need to generate a large set n. So now what you can do is just do stochastic uh, evaluation of this integral. So then uh, step four, oh, so this is step four in my notes. You generate this ensemble of phi that minimize the action or maximize the probability that they contribute to the uh, theory. So then step five, given these phi i, compute the correlation functions. Of interest. For each i, right? So we go back to here. There's some correlation function we want. And remember, in quantum field theory, quantum mechanics, the only observables come from correlation functions. This defines the theory. So given the set of phi i's, you compute these correlation functions. And then step six. You have to do your homework, and you have to learn how to get as much physics from Euclidean space as possible. Why? Because what we've done since we've discretized the theory, we solved it on a discrete set of imaginary time. What does that mean? If you only have a finite n and a discrete set of time, there's no unique way to analytically continue back to Minkowski space. So the only thing you can do is get information out of these Euclidean space correlation functions. That's important. We have to think how, what kind of information can we get from those correlation functions. And we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Okay, so, any questions? All right, so we're gonna go to reminding you of some path integral basics. Path integral 101. Okay. You guys use 101 for the very first freshman class here in school and undergrad? No? What do you use for your very first physics class ever in, in university? What's the number? Okay. <laughs> we'll call it path integral 1. Okay. <laughs> That's a good definition, right? Okay. So, so first, we're just going to talk about real, scalar, free quantum field theory. So it's not very interesting, but it does have to set up the notation. So recall the path integral. And recall, if you are familiar, you can define the path integral with sources that you can use to compute the correlation functions. So again, this is given by this integral over all field configurations. And then we have the exponential. Here we're going to have minus a half d4x. Now I'm going to write this a little different than you're probably used to, just to help set the notation. So here we're going to take, we're just going to call it the transpose field by transpose. Our operator, if 
you recall, is b squared plus m squared. The minus sign comes, well, first of all, I'm in Euclidean space. I'm going to drop the label e, but we're always in Euclidean space from now on. And then when you do the partial integration, you pick up this minus t squared, if you recall, phi of x. And then we also have our currents. And again, I'll write this transpose here, and I'll explain why. So when we discretize the theory, what happens? So when we discretize, phi of x is simply a vector. Phi of x1, phi of x2, so on, down to phi of xn. Right? It's a, it's a, you can think of it as a column vector in space. And so then this is going to be an operator. This is going to be some matrix. And as I've written it here, I've already performed, say, uh, I've used a delta function to turn it into just the diagonal piece of an operator, dxx. And here, that means this has to be the transpose vector. So we're, we are taking a matrix multiplication. That's all we're doing on the computer. And so I'm introducing this transmute. This is a real value field. It doesn't make sense. It still helps you understand what you're doing is taking this column vector, you're just transposing it, and you're doing a big dot product. So that's what we do with lattice field theory. Okay. Uh, so what do we do? We want to complete the square. So we define some new phi prime. <clears throat> Let's just say minus a half. We take part of the action with phi prime minus d inverse j d this whole thing transposed uh, d phi prime minus d inverse j you can expand this out and you see that you recover exactly what you want phi prime transpose d uh, phi we get some cross terms so there's two of them which come with a plus sign you get say phi prime uh, multiply times d, d inverse j. So the d, the inverse exactly cancels. You get a similar term. This is a transpose with j transpose phi prime. And then, uh, or sorry, this isn't phi prime, these are just phi still. And then we get the last term, two minus signs. Uh, the transpose here interchanges J and D, so D minus D exactly cancel, and so we end up with plus uh, one half J transpose D inverse J. And so we see this is almost equal to what we started with. Uh, sorry, this is a minus sign, right? Because I have minus, minus, minus. So we have almost what we started with because this is a real scalar field theory, these two terms contribute, they're exactly the same. They just turn into this source term here. And so what we get is the path integral becomes d phi, well, we have to add back the term that we didn't want, we didn't start with, so we get exponential plus one half j transpose d inverse j times z of zero, no sources. So if I, you can see if I do a field redefinition from phi goes to phi prime, which is this field. And the important part is this doesn't depend on the fields, you know, phi at all. So it comes right out of, out of the integral. And then if you recall, if you want to compute a correlation function, you can take functional derivatives and you see you get exactly what you want. You take a derivative with respect to jx and then jy of this, this gives you the inverse propagator which you know is defined as the time ordered product of phi of y, phi of x. Exactly as you're familiar with. 
So now what about this z0? So here, so now I've written bigger and I have no more room to write. So uh, we'll erase this part. What is z of 0? Well, it's written there. I'll write it again. The point is we want to now evaluate this z0 because that will be relevant for doing our numerical calculations. So what do we do? Uh, step one, we introduce our conjugate momentum fields. So first uh, thing I'm going to do, shorthand, I'm just going to call this integral x. And similarly, I'm going to define Four p over two pi to the four is just integral over p. So what do we want to do? We want to introduce a conjugate variable for each of these five fields. So I have a p and a p prime. Now we're changing integration variables to phi tilde over p. We're going to have an integral over x. I'm just going to already interchange the integrals over p and p prime, or I didn't actually interchange them, like I said. So we have this integral over x. We have these two integrals over p and p prime because we're working in momentum space. We're going to have phi tilde transpose of p. Now what is this operator in momentum space? This just pulls down p squared. So this is going to be p prime squared plus m squared phi tilde of p prime. And we have e to the i p plus p prime x. Then you see, aha, You can perform the x integral to produce a momentum delta function, right? So then this just becomes, uh, right, and here I got a little too fast. We also need a d phi tilde d prime. Uh, Instead of saying something wrong, just know that it's going to work out. Uh, it's a little too fast here. We have a d phi tilde p exponential minus 1 half. You get a delta function, each one of the momentum integrals, and so we're left with an integral over p phi tilde transpose of minus p, you'll note. p prime is minus p. p squared plus m squared phi tilde p. And what do we have? The point is, this is now diagonal in momentum space. So we can perform this integral very easily. So what you want to do is remember that, what is d phi p? This is really a product over a bunch of different pi's that we integrate over phi pi. So we can rewrite this as uh, product over pi d phi pi. And then we get uh, exponential minus 1 half phi tilde transpose minus pi. I'll just call this operator d 